and and getting a feeling of power empowered by by violence that was intoxicating we spent 15 hours over two days at at Auschwitz, but energy doesn't lie you're like you can feel things in that place if you stop and just take it in that and th thank you very much um thank you very much for joining me uh, again tony um i think i think we spoke like episode five or something it was it was it was definitely over a year how, how, how have you been good how many how many episodes are you up to now i think this will be about about 55 actually funny enough oh. yeah m most have been um most have been um northern ireland uh related the the last the last good few anyway so for, for anyone who who mightn't have seen that 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 uh episode five can you give us an idea of how um you know a, a boy from a from a good family um in a, in a catholic school ended up being um for years involved in in, in white supremacy and what you would call like like a, a neo-nazi i mean i had a pretty um middle class upbringing my dad was a psychiatrist uh, my parents were, you know, stayed together for for quite a long, long time. So um, didn't have any material wants or needs. You know, I had pretty much uh, a privileged upbringing, I would say. Um, but when I was 10, I walked in on my dad with another woman. And that really rocked my world. Um, and I you know, was angry. I, I felt betrayed by the authority figures in my life. and. Uh, I felt guilty and and confused and the whole sort of swirl of emotions and and my grades by the next year had gone from A and a B down to a C and a D and you know the Catholic school that I went to was run by the Christian brothers and in, con in with the consent of my parents they decided to try and beat the grades back into me so I didn't get A or or B in major tests and assignments I was marched down to the brother's office and uh got hit on the rear end with a meter stick Jeez. Uh, when um when are we talking what what years are we talking um 78 i would have been i was 11 then and you know how the irish are we're stubborn right <laughs> my knee bends to no man so, um so the the more that that happened and that wasn't the only teacher that beat me i mean that's it was that time and it was the christian brothers and it was a catholic school so um it just made my anger and defiance worse and i went from listening to queen and elton john to the clash and the sex pistols and and uh stiff little fingers and and uh you know i ended up by the time grade nine rolls around I'm, at the end of uh grade nine when I'm 14 they said you know his level of defiance is kind of off the chart there's not any one thing he's done worthy of expulsion but um he's kind of a bit of a pain in the ass so you take him somewhere else at the end of the year and and uh we won't expel him and uh, I chose at that point to go to boarding school in England and so I went to a boarding school in Scarborough and, and it was uh being I mean, I chose this school because it was Scarborough. It's at the Seaside Resort. I just come from an all-boys school, and it's uh, it's co-ed. Probably wasn't the wisest idea to choose that school. It was it was a Methodist school, and I was one of two Catholics with an Irish last name, and most of the students there were British Army kids. So it's, it uh, that didn't work out too well either. But it was when I was in England and visiting my my granddad in, in St. Helens and that that at first got introduced to and, and sort of came in contact with the uh, with this whole skinhead uh phenomenon and when I came back to Vancouver um you know I, I got involved with the with the skinheads back in Vancouver and you know people my parents asked me like why, why are you hanging out with these guys like they're, they haven't finished school they're not going anywhere you've got all this privilege you can go do anything that you want in life there's nothing you you can't do if, if you want to do it and um you know, in, uh, upon reflection, I hung out with them because they had the one thing that I didn't have, and that was toughness. I was a smart kid at school. I wasn't a tough kid. Um, and going from the receiving end of powerlessness and violence at the hands of, of teachers at school to going on 
the giving the doling it outside and and getting a feeling of power empowered by by violence that was intoxicating was there were, like did, did the actual kind of kind of racist or, or, or xenophobic aspect appeal to you at the time or, or did it just kind of come along it, with it wasn't a big you know it was more about drinking and drinking and fighting and you know go to punk shows and you know get in fights with punks and it started off just sort of um random you know hooligan kind of stuff you know like just going out looking for fights and, and they're not hard to find and they're not hard to create fights either um but as the music started to change and the politics went from sort of lazy casual nationalism to um you know screwdrivers for single white power in 1984 um, that really kicked it off and and it became the the racist scene became its own music subgenre. And back then there was no internet, there wasn't there wasn't anything. The music was probably the biggest, biggest one of the biggest recruiting tools at the time. And and you just get all these ideas reinforced and you have um you know you have this community and a and a shared goal and you start to you know synchronize it starts to become organized and and I was at the forefront of of organizing these people because I, I wasn't a tough kid, but I was a smart kid. And so that's, it just kind of devolved. And then we got to a certain point where the older, more established groups um, contacted us. We came into contact with them and and then we sort of started to do security for their events and, and things. This is in Canada, right? Yeah. Back Canada. Things went rap- rapidly escalated from there and, you know, I think it was 1988, but it was the first time that I found myself down at Area Nations in Idaho. And then I started to get in touch with other U.S. groups and it just kind of spiraled. You know, every every step deeper I went, I got more notoriety. With the notoriety, it generated more fear. With that was a false sense of power. And so, um, and, and in, in these movements with, that were led by older men. I got, um, I got a, a sort of attention and approval from these older men in a way that I could never get it from my dad. Right. right so right. I would go out and use my use my smarts to do events that would generate publicity and, and organize these people and all these things, and I'd get the pat on the back from uh, these father like figures for me, and and that was, um, you know, that became a vicious circle and you keep doing more and more and more to to keep the whole thing going and you know and most people think it's about the ideology and it really isn't and the ideology is the pill you swallow and I got attention when I felt invisible I got acceptance when I felt unlovable and I got power when I felt weak but if I had all of those things you know um, if I was captain of the football team I could have got all of those things in a healthy way, but I, I wasn't a jock. That didn't didn't happen. And maybe if another group or club or uh, association and sort of got a hold of me before this did, um, that may maybe would have changed things. And you know, somebody said, you know, if only the chess, only if only the chess club got to you first. And I said, <laughs> you probably didn't have enough adrenaline in the chess in the chess club. But I get the point. But but something yeah even if it was like like a martial arts gym or a boxing gym you you probably kind of could have got um a lot of the similar things you were you were looking for but but from uh but from like a healthy source D- did you at this stage um when when like you're you're starting to security and stuff like at this stage did you have like like hate for for Jews and and black people or or whoever else did did, did you uh did, did you genuinely feel it or. I didn't grow up with it in the in the household, you know, any more than, you know, my my father was bombed by the Germans during World War II, so he certainly uh, didn't approve of it. And you know, I suppose it's a funny way to be angry at your dad is to have a poster on your bedroom wall of the guy who sent the bombs, right? Wow. Okay, so yeah, um, like, uh, did 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 you did you at at any stage um d- develop like? develop like like a genuine dislike or, or hatred for for these groups yeah and and you know i didn't really know many people from those groups so it was easy to dehumanize them because there was no human relationship really to 
contradict it or to to untangle it. And um, you know, when I when I say hatred, you know, often when people think of hatred, it's this they think of you know the screaming skinhead with the swastika flag. Um, what what you see in that scenario is more rage than hatred. For me, hatred is a is a cold emotion. You know, it's um it's a disconnection. It's a complete lack of empathy lack of compassion and it's it's just a disregard you know at, at that level of hatred it's not about getting emotionally and angry about the, it's they're reduced to ledger entries a logistical problem to solve you know um it's the the butterfly collector that kisses his family goodbye and goes to the concentration camp and does experiments on people that cold detached um for, for me, hatred is a very cold emotion, but often it's mixed with anger and rage, which it appears um, it appears to be a hot emotion, but it's the anger and rage that's the hot emotion. The hatred is, for me, it's cold. Sure, sure. Um, oh, oh, okay, so so what what time would you describe like your peak um, involvement in in the movement? What 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 years and and like what what age were you and and kind of what what did you believe at the time at, at the peak of it? I'd say in the early nineties, so I would have been involved for about a decade by then. I was running a telephone hotline that was the subject to human rights commission complaints and going to tribunals, and um, there was appeals that went to the Supreme Court of Canada, and I was doing television, national television in the United States. I did the Montel Williams show twice, and. I uh, was flown to Germany with Tom Metzger to go visit Auschwitz with a Jewish radio sh talk show host that we just ended up getting deported from Frankfurt Airport. But um, so that was in the peak notoriety. And at that point, um, what what happens is ideology and identity become entwined. So it wasn't just what I believed. It was who I was. It was what I watched the friends I hung out with, it was the music I listened to, the books I read, the clothes I wore, there's, you know, definitely a uniform element to it. And it's really, it's difficult to get someone to believe that what they think is wrong, that the ideas they have are wrong. It's a whole other order of magnitude greater to try and get somebody to admit that who they are is wrong. And that's one of the challenges with trying to uh, untangle this. But at that point, we felt that there was this international sort of hive mind, this Jewish cabal of um, Jews that were really behind the hidden hand behind everything that was wrong in society, whether it be immigration or pornography or you know homosexuality at the time. Um, all of these things that we saw as ills to society, there was sort of this global cabal of George Soros-like people that were making it all happen. Um, okay, so like a, a, again a, a, at your peak, um, what did you actually want to do uh, with or to Jewish people? What, was it a case of just kind of like get out of my country and and go go somewhere else, or what did what, what did it have gone as, as far in your mind as, as wanting to 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 get rid of them? We would have expelled them all, including non non white people, like including minorities. Okay, I see. But 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 the um of course if necessary. That was what we believed. I mean I I have obviously very different views on immigration now. Of course. No, of course. Um so uh obviously we'll 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 get to the um the, the movie about about vi visiting Auschwitz, um which is particularly um significant given that along uh, going along with being a neo Nazi is is generally being a Holocaust denier. Um, so like at the time, uh, again, your, your, your peak involvement, what would have been like the strongest arguments you would have brought out, um, to, to convince, to convince people that, that the Holocaust isn't what it was, or was greatly exaggerated. What, what were like the, what was like the steel man version of it? Uh, it came down to mathematics. So the, that, that was the most powerful argument for me. And it was the hardest one to resolve. Um, and, and it's, you know, it comes down to, um, you know, because I had called up the crematory in Vancouver, the, where they cremate people before they bury them and everything like this. I said, how long does it take to cremate a human body? And the modern 
crematories do three hours per body. And then also, so we use three hours, you know, the, the, these, uh, these burn hotter than the ones in Germany, the ones in Germany or Poland, not Germany, um, you know, at Auschwitz, for example, the coal powered, the modern ones are gas powered. Um, so it became this technical argument. And so you go, there's, you know, 48 retorts, 48 crematories at, at the camp and, you know, at three hours per body, 24 hours in a day, you know, there's a, there's a mathematical limit to, to how many you can cremate. And the, the numbers at the time, it, it, the math didn't add up. So that it didn't make sense. Um, but what, what I didn't understand at the time was that, you know, when they cremate human bodies, now they also cremate in the coffin. You know, the, the, the bodies are filled with embalming fluid. They're not desiccated and starved. You know, they're not being put in an oven two at a time. They're not being perfectly cremated to, to nothing. And, and when you sort of take all of those things into account, the numbers do, do match. And, you know, for me, um, you know, coming back to this cold, detached hatred, you know, sitting around arguing about whether it was 4 million or 2 million or 6 million misses the point entirely. One, one is too many. You know, but to reduce it to a, a sort of detached mathematical uh, equation and ledger entries, um, you know, I'm I'm ashamed of how detached I was in that. I thought of it in such such a callous callous way, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to be involved in and in, um, make this film. You know, if there's one people on the planet that I had harmed the most, it with my words and and deeds and everything, it was the Jewish people. And so this film is part of my atonement, part of my correcting the record for the for the things that I had said and you know denying um, denying the pain of the survivors and their families. You know, there's a part in the film where I said, you know, when I think about it, you know, if you're if you're covering up a crime, a murder after it happens, um, does that make you an accessory after the fact? And that's how I, that's what I feel about my activities uh, as, a, as a Holocaust denier back in the, in the 90s. That's what it feels like. And so um, this, this is a way to correct that. Sure. Um, unfortunately, there's still, um, uh, I, okay, I, obviously when, when you were at it, like you said, no internet, word traveled um, a lot, a lot more slowly. It had to be a magazine or, or a phone hotline. I mean, now obviously we have internet. We literally have live streaming. Um, uh, unfortunately, there there is still um. You, I I I don't know. I don't know where the 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 levels are if if it's more or less. But there is still um Holocaust denial. There's kind of a there's a kind of a, a semi famous street streamer named Nick Fuentes. You, yeah, you've heard of him. Um, did, from from okay. For, firstly, do do you do you kind of check in on? On, on these people to 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 see what arguments they're making and and how they're going about um recruiting people and if so have the the arguments they use changed at all over the years no because that individual who you're talking about um used you know the cookie monster and how many cookies can you cook in an oven and and the mathematics it's the same argument now the arguments haven't changed but I think I think you'll look at the you know for the reasons that i have expressed the the numbers um do add up when you take those other things into account it's easy to he's making the same mistake i made um like like at the time it, for, for you this wasn't a grift this was a, a genuinely held belief yes uh, um it, it's crazy the um I mean, I mean, with the internet, it, it, it any tool can be used for for good or bad. Um, you know, the internet can be used by uh, by Nick Fuentes, or or it can be used by by someone like you do, do, doing the complete opposite. But um, Jesus, I mean, uh, if 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 we had like the the level of uh, the level of tech 
but back then we, we, when you were at it, what, what do you think you would have been doing? Could you have seen yourself being like the live stream or, or, or just using just using the, the other oh, cable? I was I was involved at the very beginning of the Internet, you know, and I built a, one of the very first white power websites for resistance records. You know, as I said, music was such a powerful recruiting tool amongst young people and and you know whereas you know a book or a pamphlet or you know something is just in your head music involves multiple sections of the brain and and music ties emotion into the into the ideas music is so powerful um but you know the difference is is when the internet first came in you use the internet you know primarily to find information you would search for information What's happening now is people are searching for community and they're getting their information from these communities that they that they join in. And people, um, you know, look, the, just because the Internet is around doesn't mean things like QAnon don't, you know, it, it's not the solution to misinformation because there's there's so much misinformation um, and disinformation, even coming from you know official or official or what were once trusted sources, um, what do you believe? What is the what is the truth? And I think the um, you know none of this stuff really happens in a vacuum, and and now people don't know who to trust, you know, as far as sources go, and so that 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 mistrust can be manipulated, you know that. Um, just like people's alienation in society can be manipulated, just like people um, are feeling replaced or left behind can be manipulated. You know, there's there's a thing called the great replacement theory that there's, you know, this, you know, cabal of Jews, the same hive mind that I was talking about 30 years ago is is planning this great replacement of white people through through offshoring and immigration and all these it's it, it's the same stuff that, that i was talking about that we were talking about 30 years ago but it's given the name of the great replacement theory and it's it's a you know it's a it's a it's a wild conspiracy theory but it doesn't mean things aren't happening in society where people aren't feeling like they are replaced you know that feeling is real for some people and in the same um, way, in the same way that that in like in 1930s Germany, the the German people were were very much vulnerable to someone coming in and and uh, finding a group to blame all their problems on. They, they were like beaten down and worn down. There was a lot of things to be angry about, and then someone kind of came along and and, and focused it. There's there's an emotional need to be able to un, find a simple solution to these complex problems, and um, Hitler did that magnificently i mean when you think you know we talk about this in the movie the end of world war one and there's three and a half million german men dead at the end of the war that's left millions of people fatherless and some guy shows up in the in the 20s start talking about the fatherland and being a father figure you know it, the, it, he masterfully exploited the psychic needs of the of the german people who were reeling from humiliation and, and wanted a scapegoat for what they were what they were feeling it's not an excuse for what happened and i'm not suggesting that for a second but you know there's things you know there's lots of people that are struggling in in today's society and there, there are people that masterfully exploit that feeling of alienation and offer simple solutions to complex problems and meet their emotional needs and, know, and, and when it's when it's related to country as well it's a good feeling to say, "Oh, I'm an American, or I'm, or I'm Irish, or, or, or it's um, it's a, uh, it, it's an easy one. You're you're born with it. You, you kind of didn't have to do anything to earn it, um, and it's a, it's a good feeling to to be tribal in that sense. Um, and, and yeah, you're not, you're not alone when you're tribe, right? Easily, easily exploitable when, when when you're in that mindset. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and and you know. People that are very good manipulate manipulators know exactly how to um, do that. Again, we'll we'll speak about the the trip to Auschwitz, but um, I think I think before that, you you mentioned in our last interview that one time you went to a synagogue um, and you were invited in, and, and it was a, a place where you 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 committed a I think it was classed as a hate crime. Um, can, can you tell us about that? Because in a way, it's I guess a little similar to the the, the Auschwitz trip. 
Yeah, and it's not entirely disconnected because the rabbi, I always say I'm not Jewish, but I have a rabbi, Rabbi Dan, at that um, at that synagogue in Vancouver. But the very first anti-Semitic act I did when I was a young man was to put a National Front sticker on the front door of that synagogue. And that was 30 years earlier. But to be at that congregation um, in the spirit of atonement, um, and what I'd learned from Rabbi Dan is I learned about tshuva, and tshuva in Hebrew means to return, and it means to return to God and our fellow human being through acts of atonement and repentance. It's not enough to say you're sorry; you have you have to do things to um, to make up for the for the wrongs that have that have been done. And I went there in that spirit, and I I was nervous. I mean, I was expecting to get yelled at and people to be angry at me but they were so welcoming welcoming it meant a lot to them that you know someone who would you know because they have anti-semitism going on all the time and and all kinds of crappy things happening to them but nobody no one ever says sorry and and uh, it was just a really powerful experience for them and that in turn was a very powerful experience um, for me, and I've worked with other communities that I've harmed, the Indo-Canadian community here in Vancouver. 1998, a Sikh caretaker was murdered by five skinheads. I, I think I'd met a couple of them, but I didn't recruit them. But guys I recruited recruited them. Um, and I've made my uh, peace with that community and, and actually the victim's family. Um, I've done it with the gay community because I committed gay bashings when I was 17 and and, and such. And that did that sort of same um, process of reconciliation and and atonement. And I've, I've been lucky enough to have a sort of a guide at each step of the way to help me do that in a thoughtful way that doesn't, because you can, if you're not careful, you can do more damage when you, when you sort of, um, yeah, I, I mean, as you, as you know, <laughs> the whole Irish question, right? I mean, it's, these things are delicate. When was it that you began having like your first doubts about uh, about the movement, and then and then eventually getting getting out? What 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 years and, and what age were you? Mid nineties. By the time I left, it was ninety eight, um, which was the year Normal Saint Gill was murdered. Um, you know, it was the disillusionment. I, I, my friend who had the res resistance records, he was disillusioned, and we were sort of both talking our way through that. American History X was a powerful piece um, that sort of cemented my disillusionment, but really was the birth of my children, even though they were born in 91 and 92. Um, by the time they were four and six, I was a full-time single father and, and um, I had to make choices, right? And I didn't want to give up my identity as white power leader, but um, I was kind of forced to. I mean, I could have chose to abandon my kids and stay with stay with that that leadership role but I chose um you know how I said to myself is you know instead of fighting for a bunch of white people who couldn't care whether I lived or died what I if, if I really want to do something for the white race I'll make sure these two children thrive and survive and that's how I shifted my identity from white power leader to single dad um, and kept my identity intact because the the ego fight to the death to keep the to keep the identity and um, you know, my children really began a thawing process, really started to open my heart. And it's because children at that age, their, their love is infectious. And they saw this great, magnificent dad and great, magnificent human being that I didn't see when I looked in the mirror. And, you know, they're safe to love. You know, we sort of put on armor and shield our heart you know, in order to feel safe and, and to avoid hurt, you know, we put on masks to be someone we're not in order to be accepted or to be loved. Um, with my kids, I didn't have to do that. And they're not, they're not capable of shaming ridicule or rejection at, at that young age. That comes when they're <laughs> in spades and they're teenagers. Um, but in that moment, it was safe for me to uh, sort of come in from the cold, come in from the darkness of disconnection and to start to very gingerly feel things again. And that started to unravel things. And, you know, in the 90s, single dads were like unicorns. 
and I got pats on the back and like, oh my God, it's amazing. You're a single dad. And it was like no mother and to any single mother out there listening, my hat's off to you, mad respect. No mother ever got the same kind of praise that I got because I was, I, I was a guy. I just want to acknowledge that. Um, but what I started to get in with that was I got attention, acceptance and, and um, significance um, and in a sort of healthy way, empowered. Uh, these are all in a healthy identity. And, and so it became easier for me to let go of the white power identity because um, I was getting those um, those deep, deep psychic needs met, uh, but this time in a, in a healthy way. And so by, by 1998, I, I sort of walked away. I didn't say, hey, you guys are idiots. I'm out of here. I just basically ghosted them, started ghosting them. Would it be the type of uh, the type of movement where, like, you, you kind of are afraid to go, or are they? Um, would, would they would they try to hold on to you and maybe get get nasty with it? Uh, for me, it wasn't an issue. Um, generally, it wasn't an issue. I mean, what, but I've known people that have been like assassination attempts, so they're more involved with with criminal gangs. You know, like the Aryan Brotherhood is a criminal prison gang it's less ideological um but one of the volunteers we had at uh, life after hate had had a, an attempt on his life wow just 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 for leaving or or, or for talking about it after yeah no, they shot him in the face driving down the highway I'll, I'll bring us up to um um i'll bring us up to 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 more current day and um, how did the the idea for the the movie come about the visit the visit to auschwitz well, when I when I left the movement in, in, I'll just quickly catch up to that. I left the movement in 1998. I started counseling and working with uh, with a, a coach, mentor, counselor who ironically was Jewish. Probably did a thousand hours of one on one group counseling, um, and it got my. You know, when I left, I just wanted to leave the movement behind. When I started the healing work, it was about healing myself. We want to heal others. We need to heal ourselves first. And I got to the point where I wanted to help others who are where I once um, was. And with that, with five other former uh, members from the white power scene, we found a co-founded life after hate. And I think in this, in the, in the 10 years I was at life after hate, we helped over 700 people uh, and their fa and and families of loved ones um, deal with the exiting process. Uh, and for me, um, you know, and the, and the reason I left is because it, I then wanted to work on, you know, the organization Life After Hate is up and running and it's professionalized and that's fine. It, it, it didn't need me anymore. And I wanted to work on the work of repair and going back to the communities that I've harmed. But in 2016 and 2017, um, there was a documentary film that we agreed to participate in um, because the director had a counseling background and would, would tell the story properly. And uh, Peter Hutchison is the director's name. And, and uh, if you have Amazon Prime, you should be able to find it on there. It's called Healing from Hate. And it was about a, about the work of life after hate and, and focused on prim primarily four of us. Um, but we had talked back then about... Um, somebody had wanted to take us to Auschwitz to have that sort of group experience. And but just the logistics of that never, never uh, sort of happened. And I found myself in that neck of the woods at a wedding in Budapest, uh, a conference in Warsaw and a couple of world cup games in Kaliningrad. And it was just, if I'm going to be in that part of the world, I need to go to this place. So I asked the director if he wanted to join me. And uh, we hired a Polish uh, film crew of two guys that that filmed it. And we worked with the museum at Auschwitz and they provided us with a guide handpicked uh, to work with to work with me. And we spent 15 hours over two days at at Auschwitz one on one. And, you know, it was quite intense and emotional and. Um, processing and and the the museum uh, I know on the second morning gave us three hours access to the camps before they were open to the public so we had this very deep personal personal experience and it was uh 
it was it was profound and you know i'd got intellectually the things i'd said were wrong and you know the harm i'd done and you know i i understood that and and and, and acknowledged and, and took accountability for for that but in that place in the in the different collection rooms and that you know just taking in the sheer scale of the place i got it was a deep visceral revulsion nausea disgust at, at a at a deeper level um both for what happened in the place and and what i had been involved with in, in my own uh, on my own actions at a level that was far deeper than i had pr prior to going to that camp and so it was a really profound experience for me. I, I was going to say j just that initial walk through the gates. Um, did, did the did the emotions hit you? Hit you that early? I, I I've heard that the place does have a um, almost like a chill in the air. Um, that that, that other places don't. I just, I'm a very I'm not religious, but I'm a very spiritual person, uh, and I like to say one of the things I said a couple times. It's not in the film, but energy doesn't lie. Like you can feel things in that place if you stop and just take it in. That, um, yeah, energy energy doesn't lie. And each of the each of the um, artifact rooms, you know, the rooms with the shoes or the rooms with the suitcases. Um, we didn't film in the room with the hair, but there's there's a room with thirty thousand women's hair, two and a half tons of women's hair that that had been cut off and. Um, I spent half an hour in that room. I was shattered. It was, it was deep. And it was also in that room, I felt that nausea, that disgust, that revulsion, sort of about the hair. And then I felt it again the next day in, in, uh, in, in Birkenau. And, you know, with the suitcases, I was overcome with the filming of hopelessness, the film feeling of hopelessness and you know thinking you know the people had their names their addresses their birthdays on their suitcases and they were told they were going to be resettled to the east and the you know the, the train car opens up and you're at that place and you you know where hope turns to dread you realize there is no resettlement to the east i i was gonna say i mean like like hell almost literally was a place on earth for for a lot of people you know the, these and the gulags for example and what what why is it important to to study places like uh, like Auschwitz well so here so here's the other aspect of why we made this film you know there's a recent survey in the US 66% of millennials if you just ask them cold on the street what Auschwitz was they can't say 40% of american adults so as the last of the um living survivors, the Holocaust survivors passes from this world, it, soon it will no longer exist in human mem living human memory. And for young people today, then it's just going to be black and white footage from the before time. And so, you know, the, the film isn't about me. The story isn't me. The story is, is Auschwitz. But how do we tell the film through me to make it interesting and relevant to young people today. So my story is merely used as a platform to tell the story of Auschwitz and, and what one of the lessons that we can learn from Weimar Germany and the rise of the Nazis that are echoing today. There's certainly echoes of history are certainly alive and well today in North America and in and in Europe and and sort of tying the history to the to the present. That was the goal was to <clears throat> to make that history relevant to young young people so it, it didn't just get sort of relegated to black and white footage in the before time. Sure. I, I was going to say, like, when you study history, um, it, it, it obviously hasn't even been 100 years, um, but 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 100 years when you study history is nothing. Like, it's it, it's kind of a blip, and um, and it really wasn't that long ago at all. We always have that, uh, that feeling of, oh, it could, it could never happen to me and it could never happen here. Um, but it's probably the exact same thing that, that people in Europe saw too, you know? Yeah, no, it's uh, like, I think it's Mark Twain has the um, the quote attributed to him that history doesn't repeat itself, but it sure seems to rhyme a lot. What what would be these um, these echoes you're referring to um, in uh, in like North American politics and, and, and Europe? 
Well, it's the it's the rise of scapegoating. You know, it's the rise of sort of ultranationalism and and simple solutions to complex problems. But you know, there in the film we also um, we talk. There's more recent examples, like you know, it, it's happened since the Holocaust, and um, and then you know, one of the examples we use is the Chinese Cultural Revolution, where three and a half to seven million on the high side. Um, you know, we're, we're killed because of identity politics in, in Mao's communist China. That's in the 70s. You know, and so the these mass atrocities can come from the left and the right. Um, do you have any thoughts on um, on laws that prohibit um, a Holocaust denial? I, I, I think in um, in Austria they have them. Um, personally, I, I, I think I think freedom of speech and freedom of expression kind of comes before all those things but any, any thoughts for yourself you know when it comes to freedom of expression um i tend to err on the side of freedom of expression and and you know once um because now you know it's not just holocaust denial that's that's prohibited it's you know there's all kinds of you know there's been a great you know basically anything that, that contradicts the um official narrative of certain certain topics or events you know that you know once you start where does it stop on the censorship sh exactly and, and it's so it's so subjective once you give the government the, the power to 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 prohibit speech like that it's it's so subjective to, so it can, it can be applied to so many things yeah like you said yeah no having having said that you know knowing you know the pain and suffering of the the people that died, the people that lived, and their families, uh, second and third generation Holocaust survivors that are still suffering, you know, generational trauma because of it. Um, it it's a it's a horrible thing to do, you know, and and you know denying it, making light of it, for me, I felt um, was another crime against them against those people and so um yeah so it's it's balancing those actually yeah it, it's interesting that the way you said it about um it won't be long until no one with a living memory um is 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 alive with it um i i actually know uh i i know an israeli friend who grew up in an apartment building where one of mengel's twins um actually lived like like really old but um, but but one of the twins from from like Dr. Mengel's um experience w w was that actually w was that in Auschwitz? Do you know? I think Dr. Mengele was was in Auschwitz, and there were there were kids in Auschwitz that were separated from the from their parents, and we, you know, you got pictures of five year olds with concentration camp tattoos on their arms. It's it's terrible. When when I was in Budapest, um. For my friend's wedding, we stayed in an Airbnb in the old quarter of of Budapest, and um, you know, me and uh, my fiance at the time were wandering around, and and we came across this memorial to the, the Budapest ghetto. It was four hundred thousand people were, I think, in nineteen forty four, forty three. Uh, I can't remember the date, exact time, but they were sent to Auschwitz from from Budapest, and you know, you look through these little peepholes in the wall, and you, you, they had these sort of magnified black and white pictures of what was vibrant Jewish life in, in the in the 30s and 40s and uh, 30s in in Budapest and you know I looked up where the the walls of the Budapest ghetto they had this sort of mapped out streets and then where the where the walls of the ghetto was and I realized that the Airbnb we were staying in was like in the middle of what was the Budapest ghetto and these are the original buildings you know, from 100, 200 years ago and realized that, you know, the bedroom we were sleeping in um, in 1944 would have been crowded with with Jews sort of await, awaiting their their fate. It was really a profound moment. But you walk around and there was there's no sign of Jewish life anymore. You know, there was a synagogue that was um, barely getting open again. We went to Krakow, the same thing. Krakow used to be a quarter Jewish. And um, there's seven synagogues in the Kashmir district of, of Krakow. And and only one, the smallest, is able to have services. And, it, you know, in the 
from what I understand in the in the Jewish faith, you need 10 men to form a minion to sort of have a proper service. And in the wintertime, they don't even have 10 men to do a proper service. And, you know, if you look in the doorways uh, in that area, there's a sort of indentations in the doorways where the um, Jews have had mezuzah scrolls, which is something they touch on the way in and on the way out of their doorway. You don't see any mezuzah scrolls anymore, but you see all these buildings that you like every every door has got a mezuzah indentation where it once was. So you see these relics. It's almost you see this evidence of what was once thriving Jewish life and culture in these places, and it's it's gone. And that, that's what made it really profound when we went to um Auschwitz and then went to Birkenau, the sheer scale of it. I mean, it's not a death camp, it's a it's a machine. Like when you think about all the um, parts, the, the logistical operation, the bureaucracy, the trains, and, and when you understand it's not just what happened in that camp, it's what happened in Budapest, it's what happened in Krakow, uh, Krakow, they went to Mandina. Um, But there were cities all over Europe that were emptied of Jews that, that went to, you know, Auschwitz was one of six killing centers um, and you think about the scale of that logistical operation, and it's mind blowing. It's mind blowing. And, and, and the other thing that Holocaust deniers often say is, "There's show me the plan." There's no written plan. There's no evidence that there was a written plan. You know the, you know nobody took, nobody wrote it down at the Wawanzi conference or whatever. Um, but you, there's no way that you could make that happen without a plan, you know, that you could get 400,000 Jews from Budapest to Auschwitz and, you know, 300,000 from Warsaw or what, whatever was there. And, you know, we got to go to Warsaw uh, to where the Warsaw ghetto was and there's, there's nothing left of, you know, the, all the buildings were leveled. And the one picture that was so striking was the picture of, um, of a, a Catholic church with a spire sitting in the in the middle of a uh, couple square kilometers of rubble, you know, and after the Warsaw uprising, the ghetto uprising, the Germans basically went house to house and blew all the buildings up, you know, and you see all this rubble and then the Catholic church, it's you sort of, it, it when you go there and you sort of experience the reality of it, it's, you can't deny it. You know, it's easy to point to, you know, something in a YouTube video or, you know, some mathematics on the back of a napkin or, or, or something in a book that's detached from it. When you actually go and see what, what you can see that, that there was once a thriving Jewish people and culture in these places and it's gone, it's, it's eliminated. Um, it, it's, we see it all strung together like that. And you understand really the, that this was a massive machine that had a, a ton of people working on it and a ton of resources and a ton of trains and trucks and, and whatever. Um, it, it, the evidence is overwhelming. Yeah, so, so many kind of um, ordinary Germans who, I mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't call them like like victims. What what, what they were doing was terrible, but but in a sense they were they were trapped. Um, in a sense, too, because they can't go against the the Third Reich, they they probably be killed themselves. So just the uh, just the corrupting effect on people's souls that that just happened to be to be born around there is is insane. Like Hannah, Hannah Herent, uh sort of writes about it in uh, her book, The Banality of Evil. You know about Adolf Eichmann, and he was just um, this sort of less than ordinary bureaucrat, you know, that scheduled, you know, he, you know, I think he said in his trial, like, I, I didn't kill anybody. I just, I just pushed paper around. You know? like, like, like it was like, it was importing fruit and, you know, it could have been like, like an animate object. Yeah. Yeah. Again, that that's goes back to what I sort of said at the beginning about that hatred being um, a cold emotionless, um, the disconnection um, that allows people to be 
become cogs in that machine. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll leave you go soon enough. To, thank you very much for, for all your time. Um, is there anything you want to leave us with um, just in, in relation to the documentary or, or just anything we've spoken about? Uh, again, th thank you for everything you shared now. Yeah, you can go to um, thecureforhatefilm.com to check out when release dates might be happening. And we're on the Cure for Hate film on Facebook and Insta and stuff like that. And check out um, Healing from Hate on um, Amazon Prime. Very good. We'll, we'll we'll put a link to everything. And I, I might ask you one more thing. What what did um from the visit itself? What what would you say was your biggest takeaway? It's probably something you've discussed, but but if you if you could say like the the, the biggest thing that you were taught or or that you came away with, there was there was my own self reflection because in many ways I was confronting myself there. So it was um a deep understanding, a much deeper understanding of my role and the damage and harm that I had done, you know, because um, white supremacist ideology or anti-Semitism, if left unchecked, always ends in murder. And this is sort of the ultimate sort of example of that. Um, and just um, really a, a profound understanding and, and the importance of keeping the memory alive of those people, what happened there, those individuals and, and not, ever letting it be forgotten because if we let it be forgotten it's at our own peril um thank you very much again um i i, I appreciate it I, everything you shared now uh th thank you very much mate thanks